<laughs> Even the best of men are men at best. Even the best of men are men at best. In my lifetime, whether it was politicians or different people in different positions, um, some have been wonderful, some have disappointed. But I can stand here today and say, our Heavenly Father will never disappoint us. Will never disappoint us. Good morning. Good, morning. Good to see you. God's blessings to each and every one of you. Good to see uh, you folks, and I'm anxious for the end to be here soon. Uh, I know that uh, I've been in touch with the people here in Lycoming County, and they're, they're claiming we'll be getting shots in the not too distant future for, I know this doesn't include most of us, but for those that are 65 and older, <laughs> Good morning, uh, honey. We have someone here. No, you're not, you've been here before. You've been. I know I married you. <laughs> I, I, I know. I, I remember that. <laughs> but I, I was pretty sure you had been here before, too. Uh, and of course, we want to welcome our podcast uh, listeners and our uh, live stream viewers. We get feedback from those folks all the time, and we appreciate that. The Women's Fellowship will be meeting next week at 10 o'clock here at the church, and the men's breakfast will be, uh, the men's will be meeting at 8 o'clock for breakfast here at the church. So those two things next uh, Saturday. We continue to take a love offering, uh, going towards the custodial help in that, in that nice container back there. Uh, next week, in the following week actually, Pastor Jim will be here, Pastor Jim Ritter, part of our team now, and at least for, the, for this year going forward. And Pastor Jim uh, usually likes to come up on a Saturday and stay overnight and come to church and Sunday school. Actually, he's going to be teaching Sunday school too next week. If you would like the opportunity to host him, have him stay overnight at your place, uh, let us know. Uh, we, we're okay for January, for, our, for these next two weekends, but if you, in the future, would like to do that, he's a good guy, and a great, uh, I think you'd enjoy having him around. Pastor Steve is back in the States. Uh, for those of you who did not know, he and Karen had gone to Uganda. Uh, some things that the important things to take care of there. Uh, he has to quarantine for, I think, 14 days once he came back. Uh, and that's, uh, so we'll be seeing him soon. We'll be seeing Pastor Steve soon. I think those are all of my announcements. Anything else for the good of the order? Beth will get us started then with our worship. <coughs>
Amen. Thank you. But, uh, number 508, our opening hymn, Love Lifted Me. Karen will come and join us here at the organ, and we'll sing all the verses, and then we'll stand as we sing. Words will also be up on the screen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the love, your love that lifted us from the depths of sin. And it's your love that has brought us here today. As we worship you this morning, we pray that uh, our offerings of praise and thanksgiving will be worthy, worthy of your name, the blessed name of Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. And we're going to sing number 630. What a friend we have in Jesus.
Number 635, in the garden. I was talking to Barb and Paul Hoffmaster uh, this week, and they're doing fine. They said hi. And uh, this was Barb's, I think, Barb's favorite song. <laughs> so let's sing In the Garden. Thank you. This wasn't scheduled. <laughs> I do this every now and then to Beth. Uh, Beth, maybe Park, you can stay here. I'd like to sing 649. I just heard that this morning. When I look into your holiness. We'll just sing it a cappella, okay? Okay. Uh, I guess it's okay. <laughs> I can play very quietly. Okay. Beautiful little chorus. The 
Am I okay, Steve? I'm good? Those words are really special. When all things, when all things that surround become shadows in the light of you, I worship you. But particularly the words, I, the reason I live is to worship you. I trust that that's the reason you live today. Anyone with a praise? I wanted to praise this morning. Yes, Don. Starting today, the sun will be setting after 5 p.m. in Mexico. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> well, I have one along those lines, too. Today is the 41st day of meteorological winter, which means we only have 49 days of winter to go, meteorological winter to go. I saw another hand. Anyone else with a praise? Park? I shared with you guys last week, those of you who were here, that my sister in law has passed away from the children of that county community. It affected her in the same way. And I was privileged to be at her funeral this week. And um, I came away from that funeral with a um, spiritual high. She knew the Lord, she loved the Lord, she had, she knew she was going to die, so she had prepared a lot of things, but she had a dumb at her funeral, and the singing, the singing was awesome, and the funeral service went out to the graveside, they sang a lot of songs, the graveside, and while they were closing the grave, continued singing, <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Just a reminder as we go to prayer, uh, we no longer, we're not passing the offering plates right now. They're back there for anyone to use this morning. But we also want to say thank you to the podcast listeners and the live stream listeners. I, I know I got two checks in the mail this week from people that uh, listen or come when they're looking forward to coming in the spring. And I know, Louise, you got three checks here at the church. So that's really appreciated, uh, those checks that come in. And it's, it's awesome, really inspiring. Any prayer requests? Nancy? I gave you the prayer request regarding the trouble of the Little Bobby. Tough, tough for a little guy. That's Bobby, Bobby Mussington. I saw another hand. Marcia? Like a prayer and a praise. Um, my cousin Dale Preston passed away on Friday. Um, for comfort to the family, his wife passed away on Friday. And uh, we're going to praise that he is with the Lord now. And his name is Dale? Dale. Dale. Any other prayer requests? Let's unite our hearts as we go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, as, as you look upon us, have mercy. Have grace. 
We ask for forgiveness of sins, and we ask that we in turn would have forgiving hearts. Raise up in this difficult time, we ask that you would raise up leaders with courage, with a moral compass, leaders who know you and who love you and want to serve you. And in the, the dark times, may we see your light, a light that shines brighter and brighter in the darkness. We thank you so much for answered prayers. We continue to lift up the folks on our prayer list for some unspoken requests for Mary Ann, for Zach, for Bill, uh, who had suffered a stroke, for Bobby, who's dealing with this difficult situation and a cancer, for the family of Dale, and we're just thankful that he knew you as Lord and Savior. And we especially pray for our nation. We pray for healing. We pray for your wisdom. We pray for justice to be done. And now as we continue our worship, we would ask that you would draw us close to you this morning. Brighten our spirits. Renew our faith. May we leave here with joy and peace, knowing that you're sovereign God and in control of everything. And we ask all this this morning in your son's blessed name, in the name of Jesus. I was going to say I have a problem. It's not so much a problem. <laughs> it's just the way God made me. He made me this way. Uh, I've always been a very competitive individual. I played sports or was involved with sports most of my life. I, I played competitively till I was 30. I, I coached till I was 45. Not that there's anything wrong with being competitive, except I really liked to win. I really liked to win. And not that there's anything wrong with that either, if it's kept in check. And my competitive nature carried over into every aspect, really, of my life, not just sports, but maybe winning arguments, being very engaged in political fights, trying to right the wrongs, or at least what I thought was wrong. And sometimes that can get you in some difficult problems. Uh, sometimes I had trouble understanding and fathoming things, and they were difficult for me to deal with. And actually, I think I have a Quixote complex, Don Quixote from the Man of La Mancha that had to right all the wrongs, trying to right each one. I pray for elections, and it's tough for me when my candidate or candidates lose. And over the years, probably like everyone else here this morning, and uh, probably like every couple, Things have happened to Kathy and I. We built our house in 1969, and one of the subcontractors really goofed. I mean, this was a major goof. And he, uh, it, it cost us a lot of time. It cost us a lot of uh, money. And uh, we didn't know how to get this resolved. And he didn't want to resolve it. He didn't want to take any responsibility. We wind up in court, which is not a good thing. My professor at Lehigh, when I took my school law course, said, it's better never to be in court than to be in court and win. And I think he's right. We won that particular argument. Another time, another time we had some difficulty was when our daughter got married. And I was just talking to my wife this week about it. I said, Oh, honey, I feel so badly about that situation. Did I do the right thing? And she encouraged me that you did, that I did. You see, it was my daughter, <laughs> my only daughter. 
And I had three boys, but this time we were responsible for, for the wedding. And we got a guy that took the pictures, and we, he came, we talked about this, and I gave him a lot of money. It cost a lot of money to get these people, these photographers, and I gave him a lot of money. And uh, we had the wedding, and we're now looking forward to getting the pictures, and I kept contacting him, and he would not answer, and eventually we started to hear from other people, oh, he's got problems. He's not going to jail, probably. He's not paying his bills, and finally I get hold of him, and that conversation did not go well, um, because it was my daughter. <laughs> And he finally uh, admitted that he does have proofs. I said, we'll take the proofs. He didn't want to drop them off, but I insisted that he does. And he uh, came and dropped the proofs off. We were not home. Now, both of those incidents, uh, really, we kind of wound up with a very pretty good result in the end of pretty Satisfactory outcome, but I never spoke to either of those individuals again, never. The one was prosecuted. Oh, we forgave them, Kathy and I forgave them. But I, if I could go back, I had probably done some things differently. Now, more recently, we been confronted with a decision, a decision that came down to our desire, what was easiest for us, and what we actually wanted to do, versus doing something that would maybe cause us some consternation and hardship, but would keep a friendship intact and the peace intact. We chose the latter. We were within our legal rights to not do it, but one day this question surfaced for us and we talked about it. And we were getting legal advice at the time and the, uh, one, of the, one of the lawyers that we were talking to was our son and I find out that that's not always a good thing to involve family members because he, he wanted mom and dad to really take a firm stand here but I threw out this question, Kathy and I had discussed it. What is a soul worth? What is a soul worth? And I talked a little bit about that a month or so back when we talked about being made in the image of God. Would our, decisions, would our decision hinder our witness and the individual's decision to come to Christ? Well, Paul had something to say about relationships, about what really is important, about what we need to do as believers. Over 2,000 years ago, Paul left his sidekick, Timothy, in Ephesus to lead a group of new churches there. And Paul sends him a letter, and in his letter to Timothy, he gives some instructions. And we're going to read from Paul's letter to 1 Timothy chapter 2. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, the first six verses. Let me read those words. I urge, now this is Paul speaking to, to Timothy. I urge then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in the godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, men, and the man, Christ Jesus, is that mediator, who gave himself as a ransom for all men, the testimony given in its proper time. Paul, in these instructions to Timothy, begins with this admonition. Pray. Pray. 
pray for all men. It's seen as a privilege and an obligation. And he doesn't say, he doesn't say pray for those you like. He doesn't say pray for those you agree with. He doesn't say pray for those who are in your political party. Or pray for those who are more like you. Or pray only for those who are believers. And I'm sure we should all pray for those folks in those categories. But I believe Paul really means here when he says it, pray for all people. Even if they drive you crazy. And there are some that kind of drive me crazy at times. And Paul makes special mention of kings, leaders, including, this would include governors and judges and presidents, you name them. Anyone, he says, in authority. We're to pray for them. We're to pray for them. A few years ago, um, Pennsylvania Supreme Court came down with a decision that... Uh, I took a great deal of interest in. It was a, actually a local case, and I know I shared this a while back. It was a local case involving a woman who had, uh, had a drug overdose, and she was saved, but she was carrying a baby, uh, I think about an eighth, eighth month of her pregnancy, and the baby died. Now, Pennsylvania had just passed a, a new law. It had been approved in the House, it had been approved in the Senate, it had been signed by the governor, not the present governor, this was before. That if you did something like that, if you took drugs and those drugs contributed to the death of your baby, you could be held for homicide, or not homicide, but I uh, can't think of the term. Uh, like a, it wasn't a murder charge, but it was a, a manslaughter. manslaughter, thank you, a manslaughter charge. So I followed this because this is a local woman down in the Williamsport area. Followed this case really carefully. Long story short, uh, it was thrown out. The, the law was ruled unconstitutional. And what drove me crazy were the arguments that two, two of the judges made one of the judges said simply that, well, because it wasn't born, it wasn't a baby. It was just a fetus. And the other judge simply said that they see no difference here. Um, this is kind of like someone neglecting their baby and not changing the diapers, and the baby gets diaper rash. That was their logic. I was angry, I was disappointed. I was actually stunned by their reasonings. But I'm supposed to pray for them. Because Paul reminds us here that the authorities that exist are there because of God's permission, because of God's sovereignty. He puts kings on the throne for his purpose and he removes them for his purpose. And this directive that we read from Paul takes on special meaning when we consider who was in power when Paul wrote these words. It was Nero, an awful, wicked leader in Rome who inflicted terrible persecution on the Christians at that time. This is a man who gathered up Christians, bound them, and tied them to stakes set them afire so that they would serve as torches to illuminate the palace gardens. And Paul wants us to pray for him? Well, Paul gives us then two reasons in this passage why, yes, we need to be in prayer. Verse 2 and verse 4, first of all, he says, when we pray, there is a change in our attitude and our demeanor. Paul talks about us being taken from the cares and the concerns and even the chaos of a world, of the world to a place of quietness and peace, where we're sustained by our faith and our reliance in God, 
not our earthly leaders. But verse 4 here is really the crux of this matter. God wants us to pray for all men. Not that they'll do what we want them to do necessarily. Not that they'll think like we think necessarily. But, but why? What does he say? Because God desires all men to be saved. Even awful. Sinful. Neighbors, relatives, co-workers. We're to pray for them. We're to pray for our leaders. James Lankford is a senator from Oklahoma, one of my favorite senators. He's also a Baptist pastor, having served in numerous interim positions. And one of the questions he's asked the most goes like this. How do you work with some of those people here in Washington? They would drive me crazy. <laughs> And this is Senator Lankford's answer. Would you join me in prayer for them? They are my mission field. You see, he understands Paul's letter here to his friend Timothy. He understands it as an admonition, but he also understands that it is only through prayer and the working of the Holy Spirit that lives and attitudes are changed. He recently wrote an article in the Decision Magazine. This is the publication of the Billy Graham Association. And in that article, he writes a prayer. And he invites the reader to join him in prayer by reading it. And part of his prayer goes like this. This is a small part of what he wrote. I pray the leaders you have placed in authority. Notice he acknowledges that they are there by God's authority. I pray the leaders you have placed in authority would have your wisdom, Lord. Have your wisdom to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. I even choose to pray for those in authority who persecute me for my faith. Help me see them as you see them. And may I trust in your judgment, your justice. I put our leaders in your hands. Guide them as only you can. Amen. What is the value of a soul? Senator Lankford, I think, understands the great value of our souls. Because souls live forever. And he is willing to pray for people, people who... He probably has very little in common with, but he is willing to pray for them because of the value of their souls. Souls that will either live eternally in heaven or souls that will live eternally separated from God. You may not know this, but in the late 1800s, William Booth he in particular, but also the group that he founded, the Salvation Army, was subjected to tremendous persecution, vile persecution. It was actually awful what he had to endure. But he lived to see the day when God removed that trial, and actually he and his work have been honored, they were honored, and now today are revered. But they were honored by his earthly king, King Edward VII. He was from England. And King Edward invited Mr. Booth to Buckingham Palace in 1904 to honor his work and the work of the Salvation Army. The king asked Booth to write in his autograph album, and these are the exact words that he wrote to the King of England. Some men's ambition is art. I'm sorry, he starts out, your majesty. Some men's ambition is art. Some men's ambition is fame. Some men's ambition is gold. My ambition is the souls of men. We need to be in prayer for this nation and the souls of its leaders, because only God can change hearts. 
Prayer is our weapon. It's not our only weapon. We talked a little bit about this in Sunday school, things that we can do as individuals. It's not our only weapon, but it is our main weapon. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come this morning praying for men and women locally, in our state, in our nation, that you've placed in positions of leadership. We lift them up to you today, praying that they would be drawn to you, that the Holy Spirit will work in them in miraculous ways, that they will come to know you as Lord and Savior, that their souls would be saved, that their hearts would be changed. Because we know you can do this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to close today by singing the Lord's Prayer. It's number 631 on your hymnals, and I ask you to stand as we sing this song or this, this prayer. Heavenly Father, dismiss us now with the peace and joy that only you can give, but also with hearts for those that are lost. May we be praying for our leaders in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. Have a great day. Remember, the sun sets after 5 (laughs) o'clock.